Hello and welcome to EngFizz 2 po 4 This is going to be a practice problem from Beam Resonance. Today we're going to do 2019 test number 10. We have a beam that has these material properties and is thin in Y, not so thin in X, and long in Z. It is pin supported in the Y direction at Z equals 0. So on one end of the length it is pin supported in Y, which is a little bit hard to describe. What this means is it can't exert moments about x and uh, can't resist bending displacements in the y direction. So that means that the pin is actually aligned in the x direction. So it can't apply moments about x, that's the pin axis. Um, because the pin will just rotate rather than apply those moments. So this means that it can do bending displacement in Y um, around that pin, like it can have an angle in V versus Z versus its length direction. Uh, it does resist transverse displacement in X and Y, but not those bending displacements. Okay, now let's use the dynamic beam equation to find the second transverse resonant mode of the beam in the Y direction and report the angular frequency and show a plot of the mode shape. And then we're going to check the answers here with Flex PDE. So the process for doing this in Maple is gonna be similar to before. We're gonna start off with our solution to the, um, the dynamic beam equation, which is given in the notes as, let's see, so here's our dynamic beam equation, and just to summarize what's going on, we're going to substitute the assumed form, which is a harmonic solution. So we have this in the general solution section. Assume a harmonic solution, and this is going to lead to the condition uh, which gives us an ordinary differential equation on v hat. So once we've done this, then we get our ordinary differential equation on v hat, which we can solve. And the solutions for this, solutions are this thing, where beta is something that we're going to be finding by applying the boundary conditions on this, and then beta turns out to be related to ei over mu and omega by this relationship, which leads to a condition on frequency that's over here. So where we can say omega ends up being equal to the root of beta squared, um, well, root of beta to the four ei over mu, so beta squared root ei over mu. Now this is an ordinary differential equation that we can apply boundary conditions to, to solve for three of the c's, and then uh, the betas that will make this work. You don't want to solve for all four of the c's because then we um, will be eliminating flexibility we're going to use anyway when we form a linear combination and we won't have all the solutions. So uh, where do we find the boundary conditions to apply on this? Well it's in the question by saying what the supports are. This tells us that it's pin supported in the y direction at z equals zero and totally fixed at z equals lz. Now in the beam equation, not even the dynamic beam equation, but the beam equation from topic eight, we had this summary of what the boundary conditions do and why. So if we apply that here, then what we'll have is pin supported at y at uh, z equals zero. This is, so actually, I guess we need to modify this. In this particular case, when we've got the thing extended in z, we're gonna be doing the same approach, except that it's all partials with respect to z, and we've got some displacement in still the y direction, so we can still use v, which is in the z versus time, uh, and looking for v hat at z, cos omega t plus phi. And this is going to lead to an ordinary differential equation for v hat at z listed out like this. So exactly the same thing. If you want to leave it in terms of x, 
and uh, get the solution, but then make some statement that says, oh, in, in this thing, uh, really X is just the length direction of the beam always and not necessarily the direction for this particular problem. You can do that. Um, could be a little bit confusing, so make sure that you're clear about what you're, what you're talking about, whether you change the variables or not. So in this case, we're saying uh, these would be the new boundary conditions on V or derivatives of V in the length direction. So let's say where Z is the length direction. So when we solve this ordinary differential equation, we'll find an infinite number of different betas that work and each of those betas will then be correspond to one particular frequency, omega n, and one particular mode shape, v hat n, and we can find the, uh, then we'll find all of the modes, which are v n at z t is v hat n at z, corresponding to frequency omega n, and form the general solution to the dynamic beam equation, which would be the sum over all the Vn's at Z and T, N equals, I don't know, um, let's just say over all N. N, maybe it starts at one, maybe it starts at zero, N equals N naught, let's say, to infinity. Uh, now, we don't just add them up, so this is our V at Z T, the actual response. We're going to take a linear combination of all of them. And this is something we can do because this differential equation is a linear partial differential equation. Now, because we're just going to be taking linear combinations of the modes anyway, we don't really care about the final coefficient value. We can just set that equal to one and it'll still give us the mode shape. We don't need to uh, normalize that or anything. Uh, it'll just change the scale of that final coefficient. So that's a little bit of a recap of what this process is in general. In this particular case, we can go ahead and start off with our V hat, and we'll just put it in terms of Z, just to be totally consistent for this particular problem. Uh, next, what do we want to do? We want to find uh, derivatives of this. V, uh, why don't we just say VH for V hat, so I don't have to type at so many times. VH prime would be equal to the derivative of VH with respect to Z, VH double prime will be the derivative of VH prime with respect to Z, and VH triple prime will be the derivative of VH double prime with respect to Z. All right, next, uh, ooh, I put a comma there when I meant a colon. Next thing we can do is start applying these boundary conditions. So if we have the thing which is pin supported in Y at Z equals zero, then we've got a condition which is no moment applied at z equals zero. And that means that the second derivative of v at z equals zero is zero and no displacement at z equals zero. And that means that v at zero is zero. So we've got that written out down here and we can start applying that. So let's go one at a time and then we'll get the generating function on the fourth one. So subs, z equals zero into v hat. Let's have a look at it and maybe simplify. And we've got c1 plus c3. Okay, so we can use this to solve for whatever one we want. Let's solve for c1 is solve this thing for c1. Now we've got that and our v hat is simplified. No more c1s in there but it's really gonna get better once we apply the second condition. So the second one, we're gonna say subs z equals zero into v hat double prime, and we need that thing to be zero as well. Simplify this. And it says that two beta squared c3 has to be zero, and that means we're gonna say C3 is equal to zero. You could use a solve command or you could just say, all right, well, I got it. C3 is equal to zero. And next, what are we left with? V hat is now this. We've got fixed support at the other end. And that means V is equal to zero at L and uh, V prime is equal to zero at L. So let's 
apply those things. We'll say subs uh, z equals l. Is that what we called it? L? Let's just say lz. Sure, lz into v, uh, v hat and see what we get. We need the thing to be zero there. Now we can choose either to take uh, C4 as solved here, in which case we're gonna have to divide by a cinch, or take C2 as solved here, where we'll have to divide by a sign. It's more risky to divide by sign because sign has all kinds of spots where it can be zero and we don't wanna be dividing by zero or we, or we could be losing solutions by assuming that this is not zero. So let's instead solve for C4, solve this thing for C4, and assign that to C4. And then we can recap what our uh, V hat is, and we're left with this thing. Okay, so we have some stuff that still depends on Z, and other stuff that is a constant, but maybe looks like it depends on Z, it just is in terms of LZ and beta. So the final boundary condition will be that at Z equals LZ, we've got no slope either. So V hat prime sub Z equals LZ into V hat prime, that this thing has to be equal to zero. And how do we get this thing to be equal to zero? It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit complicated. Well, we don't want to have to say that C2 is equal to zero. So at this stage, let's just say C2 is one and stop messing around with it. And we want to solve for where this is zero independent of beta. There's a beta in every term. So let's divide that out and simplify that. And now this thing is going to be something that needs to be zero for us to have overall the root of this function. And this gives us a condition on beta. So if we know what LZ is, LZ is equal to two, then we can solve for exactly what beta this needs to be. Otherwise we can just solve for it in terms of beta LZ. So by putting in two there, we can just call this thing the generating function. And now we're in a position to plot it versus beta from beta equals zero to 10, let's just have a look. And this is gonna have a bunch of roots. So it's almost at the point where, um, where we've got cos and sine equals, except for the fact that cos and cinch are uh, modulating this thing. So cos is gonna be a little bit bigger than cinch for large betas. Uh, really just a difference in an exponential and that kind of decays away, they become a, a, basically the same. So it's wherever cosine is equal to sine, which is at um, 45 degrees and 45 degrees plus 180 degrees. So we can start solving for this. Um, F solve, gen function, uh, beta is equal to, um, let's say one to three. Looks like we have a root in there. Beta one is equal to that. And we should be able to get beta two, the one that we actually want because we wanted the second mode in this case. Beta two, solve the generating function between, it looks like three to four will do it. And just for good measure, let's also find the third mode so we can plot this. Um, not between three and four, but between four and six for sure. Four and six. Okay, so we've got three different betas and we could write out what resonant frequency they correspond to by putting in the E, the figuring out the mu, um, figuring out I for this cross section and then putting them into this formula. 
But even before doing that, let's form uh, v1, v2, and v3. v1 is equal to subs beta 1, well actually beta equals beta 1 into v hat. Um, let's call this v hat 1, um, v hat 2, and v hat 3 with those betas, and then we can plot them. So plot v hat 1, v hat 2, and v hat 3, x equals 0 to lz, whoops, z equals 0 to lz, and let's see here. Right, so we have something that's a fixed support at the right end, and that's why it has to have no slope as it comes into the right end, but pin supported at the left, so you see it can have slope there, but can't have any displacement and can't have any bending moment, which means it has to have no curvature at this end. So it has to come into that end at a straight line. This one, it can have curvature because we're applying a moment at that fixed support. All right, now let's put in the specific numbers. So, so all of this tells us that the solution is probably right. If, you, if we messed up somewhere, then the boundary conditions would not be looking good for this particular, well, the boundary conditions would have led to something that is not actually the set of solutions that we wanted. The fact that this now is a set of mode shapes that goes and achieves what we what we wanted at each end of Z means that we've probably got the solution right. Okay, so let's go with um, substituting in the other parameters that we've got here. So we've got E is equal to 76E9 new is equal to 0.21, though we're not actually going to need that. Row is equal to 2300. And this means that EI is equal to E times, oh, we've got to put in the dimensions as well. Let's put in uh, LX is equal to 0.4, LY is equal to 0.1. So E is equal to, EI is equal to E times the width of this thing, which is LX, times ly cubed over 12. That's our flexural rigidity thing for a rectangular cross section. And the other thing we need is the mass density mu would be equal to rho times lx times ly, the cross sectional area for a rectangle. So we now can say omega 2, the one that we needed, is equal to um, this formula that's underneath right now, beta two squared times the square root of EI over mu. And it looks like the second resonant frequency should be 2073 rads per second. So we were asked to find the second transverse resonant mode of the beam in the Y direction and the angular frequency and a plot of the mode shape. So we did that, and in fact, we found the first three. So we got the resonant frequency and the mode shape. The second mode shape is the one in green. So we could say, here's the first three mode shapes. Uh, found the first three. Second one is in green in this particular plot. And the resonant frequency is this one in rad per second. Next, we can go and make this happen in Flex PDE. So let's start off with the file that we were working through in the uh, in the lecture notes, and we'll say that this is maybe Beam Resonance 2020 Test Practice or 2020 Practice Problem not really a test this year. So uh, we'll start off by taking LX is equal to 0.4, LY is 0.1, and LZ is 2. Then we've got to lay out the beam in the direction that is that is given. So we're drawing, yes, a rectangular prism that goes from 0 to LZ and Z, and 0, 0 to LX, LY in X and Y. But do we have the boundaries set correctly? 
Well, we want it to just be free all around x and y, so we can just leave that then at the default boundary condition of the load being zero, get rid of all of those things. Oh, whoops, I got rid of a line command, didn't I? Uh, nope, uh, the line to close was just in a different spot. Okay, so this is still drawing the, um, the rectangle in x and y, and now we just need to apply things on the bottom and top of this to make those boundaries happen. So we'll say on the bottom, on z equals zero, we need pin supported so that it can only, um, so it, it can't move at all in the x direction. Value uh, u is equal to zero, and it can't move in the y direction. Value v is equal to zero, but we need to be able to apply moments in uh, in x, and those moments are going to be applied by allowing it to move in z. Now this is one way that you can allow the stress, the local stress, to be non-zero in z. You can say load of w is equal to zero. Unfortunately, this can cause problems because it's not necessarily just a pin in the x direction that will allow rotations in y. So this will allow stresses in um, in the z direction, which could be applying bending moments that'll make it displace in y. Uh, yes, what we what we want. Or rather, I should say, this will allow rotations in y because it will stop the ability of that support to apply bending moments that will uh, resist that rotation about y. So now at the at the left hand side, hmm, it's not showing up. I think if I resize it, yeah, okay. So at the left hand side of the wall, if we say this is the z equals zero side, if we say load of w equals zero, that means there's no stress in the z direction. So that will guarantee that we don't have any bending moments applied that would resist this, um, that would resist the rotation of this joint. So we are going to have no curvature at the left-hand side. The problem is that it also does that for the in and out of the page rotation, so it also means no bending moments to resist motion in and out of the page, and it means no axial stress to resist longitudinal modes. So it's possible that we could end up with those bending modes in and out of the page being uh, calculated incorrectly with this boundary condition, when really the pin support that we have would not allow those and it's possible we could have longitudinal modes which would not be calculated correctly for this boundary condition but at least as we fo at least as long as we focus in on those particular modes that are only for displacements in the y direction this will be exactly the boundary condition that we want where we're eliminating the production of those uh, bending moments at the left hand side that stop the uh, rotation. Meanwhile, at the top surface, at z equals lz, it needs to be totally fixed. So we'll say that the value of u, v, and w are all equal to zero. Now we can put in the material parameters. We've got a density of 2300. We have a stiffness of 76 gigapascals and a Poisson's ratio of 0.21. So then we can start looking for the frequencies that we're looking for. Ah, but we, we also need to excite this beam and there's all kinds of ways that we might give it some little disturbance in the y direction. We could apply a surface force. So that would be uh, maybe on the, um, on the y directed surface. So maybe like an exterior surface in Y, we would apply some um, some stress here. There's a there's a couple of different surfaces. This last one is an X surface. The one right before that is a Y surface right here. As we move uh, with L Y being the Y coordinate at each time between this point and this next point along this line, we have a fixed Y value. So we could say load. Uh, in V is equal to, I don't know, five, apply a stress of five and then get rid of that on the last surface. This will work. 
But another thing that will work is to apply a little bit of a weight in the y direction. So what we can do there is say minus um, rho times 9.81. Let's imagine that we just say, ah, you know, let gravity affect it in the y direction. This will be enough to start off the resonance and make sure we don't have just zero displacement in the uh, in the y direction and get the trivial solution. So if we haven't made any mistakes anywhere, then we can start um, start moving omega and looking for these frequencies. So let's say a thousand times oh a thousand times stage might be too much. Where do we expect the frequencies to be? We expect the the first one to be maybe um, a fair bit lower than this. So at 1.9 for that beta, we can report this as well. Omega 1 is equal to beta 1 squared. And we expect the third resonant mode is going to be based on beta 3 squared. So let's see. First one is about 640 maybe. And then the second one, 2072. And the third one, 4,324 or so. So if we are looking for one around 2000, but we don't want to make too many assumptions, let's just start off with omega being 1500 plus 100 times stage and see if anything interesting happens in there um, in the displacement in y. So let's check. We're in probably the middle of the beam is a good spot to do. I guess, yeah, it looks like we don't have any nodes showing up in the middle. Oh, one thing I didn't mention in the video is you have to make sure to report the displacement at a spot where you don't have a node. If we were to happen to pick uh, this spot right here, we wouldn't be getting the displacement that we're looking for, right? We would get a, we would have no displacement for the second mode. So even if we go at that mode, if we are exactly in the middle, we'll have uh, no displacement. It'll be hard to see that spike. But that's only if you're exactly at the node position. It's hard to do that, so it's not really a worry most of the time. Let's just go right in the middle of the beam, and uh, we should be good to get some, some displacement there. Okay, so this looks pretty promising for kind of like a pin support at the bottom and then uh, fixed support at the other end. Looks like we just passed a resonant mode there with that sharp flip. Was it a resonant mode in Y displacement? Uh, not necessarily because we're in the wrong size of this. But maybe that is to do with the uh, offset from gravity being a little bit too strong. Let's take the same signal and instead of rho times 9.81, Let's just apply some microgravity, like E minus five, and see if the plot looks the same. Just curious about that. So here we're going over there. Ah, still on the same side of, um, of zero displacement. So that is a little bit weird that we're getting this as the displacement at this point. Let's see if it persists when we zoom in. So it looks like there's something interesting going on between step five and step six. So if we take um, five for the stage, it'll be 2000. And now let's go 10 times stage and see what happens. The mode shape does look pretty good to what we're looking for. Now we are starting a little bit above and then jumping up and going across. So this does seem like it's behaving more like a regular resonant mode. It looks like between step four and step five this time. So we're going to say 20, so 2040 to 2050. There's a mode somewhere between that. So let's step down 2040 something plus our step. Looks good for displacement in Y, giving us the mode that we're looking for. And between six and seven, we've got a big jump there in displacement. So it seems that the resonant frequency is around 246 to 247. And that's, 
sorry, 200, 2046 to 2047. And that's not quite the same as we found in Maple, but because of the pin support, we're not able to do exactly the same setup as we were before. So this is not so, so surprising that we had a different result for where the resonant frequency is. What if we were to do that load in, uh, in the Y direction condition instead? So imagine here instead, we said load V is equal to some small amount and then turn that off on the other surface. Now we can get rid of this other displacement effect and see if we can zero in and find a resonant frequency around the same spot. First of all, does it seem to agree that there's some resonant frequency here? It agrees that it's close by, but we, we don't have exactly the same shape. So the previous one was going up and then down. It looks like we're very close to this resonance though. Ah, yeah, we actually got it in this scale. So it slightly changes where that resonant frequency is if you're exciting it differently in Y, but it still gives us uh, the same answer for roughly, um, well, it gives us roughly the same answer for where that resonant frequency is and the same answer for the mode shape. So we're in a position to rotate this and, uh, and look at what the resonant frequency leads to when we excite this thing. So we've got a pin support here. We said it can't move in Y or in X and that's doing a good job of holding it still that way. And um, we didn't quite make it as stiff as we were hoping for by doing that, um, that pin support thing. And interestingly, we led to a little bit of a lower resonant frequency than we would have calculated using the dynamic beam equation in Maple. One last thing is that the Flex PDE um, question here, part B, asks us to not just report the frequency we found and the corresponding mode shape with a grid plot, but it also asks us to show an elevation plot of the Y displacement versus Z along the beam. And currently our code does not do this. So the code does not have any sort of a, an elevation plot of um, the displacement versus Z. It has a displacement plot versus time, a history plot, which shows what it is at different stages, but it doesn't actually show it versus just Z along the beam. You can kind of get this from the grid plot, but not, um, not in exactly the form that it's specifically asking for. So we better put that in as well. So let's put in an elevation plot, elevation. This is like a contour plot, but in one dimension. So the syntax for this, is to say elevation of what variable you're looking for and then give it a starting point and an ending point and it'll use the line from that starting point to that ending point so uh let's see elevation we want an elevation of plot of v and let's just go along the center of the beam so we'll say from lx over 2 ly over 2 0 to lx over 2 ly over 2 and lz and this should give us an elevation plot all the way from the start to the end so here it is and we've got our displacement in v from z equals 0 to z equals lz reproducing the same kind of mode shape as we had before when we cross the resonance this should flip yes so we've got response in uh, 180 degrees out of phase from how we were actually exciting it originally when we go past that um, that resonant frequency, when we're exciting it above the resonant frequency, just like in the earlier parts of the course. So that's it. We've got our frequency determined from this zeroing in method, and we've got our frequency and mode shape in Maple determined by this zeroing in method on the, uh, on the generating function. One thing that Flex and Maple have in common this week is that the answer is not really so clear. Like the solution is not really just the final version of the code. It's kind of the process that you use to build up to that final version. I find that it's a lot easier to understand that process and just apply this same thing like we're doing in this, um, in this demonstration solution than it is to start with a completed piece of code and try and edit just exactly the couple lines that will make it solve exactly the new method for you so uh, for the for the new problem 
So this is really a place to keep in mind that the, the solution is this whole process of understanding that gets you diving in and thinking about why this is working and what the resonant mode means and how we come up to the generating function and zeroing in on this thing in Flex PDE. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.